and this is the thing that in our religion, uh, the scholars actually speak about this and they call it tadabur, reflection basically. Yeah. And they say that th- like a third of your time should be spent in reflection. You know, like reflecting is super powerful. And by the way, this isn't just an Islamic thing. Actually, it's, it's, it's wide scaled that reflecting on your life, on your blessings, on, you know, how much is going good for you, uh, you know, where you want to be in your life, etc, etc. Mm-hmm. It's super powerful, yet most people are unable to do it because they're working a job. That sounds crazy, but if you're working 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the evening, you come home at 7 o'clock, you go sleep at 9, 10 o'clock because you got to work next day, when are you thinking? Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Vision Nation Success Stories Podcast. Today, my guest with me here is Abi Musa. How you been, bro? Alhamdulillah, I've been all right. How's things with yourself? All good, man. How's your day been today? Honestly, it's been a long day, man. I mean, it's coming up to what? What is the time? Uh, eight o'clock. Yeah. I've been out since 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I had to go uh, Milton Keynes first. And uh, yeah, man, it's been a long day. But Alhamdulillah, it's good. Okay, so tell us a bit about what you do for our viewers that don't know who you are. So I, okay, so for anyone that doesn't know, um, basically I put out content on social media for, uh, in terms of business, in terms of finance, uh, more in terms of also the Asian Muslim community specifically, because I felt, uh, so I'll go into what I've done before, but basically I put out content on social media in regards to Asian Muslim majority in that niche, because I felt like whilst I was growing up, uh, the Asian Muslim community as such were massively lacking mm-hmm. when it came to um, communication skills with non-Muslims or non-Asians, for example, yeah. right? I've got this saying and I actually, um, I say this a lot actually, I say major- a lot of Asian Muslims, for example, mm-hmm. or Asians or Muslims, however you want to say it, um, the first time they deal or communicate with non-Asians or non-Muslims is when they get the job when they're 21, 22 years old. So like, for example, myself, I went to a school, predominantly Asians, went to college, predominantly Asians, etc., etc. We like to stick to our own people. Massively affects us in our growth. Mm-hmm. Um, thankfully, I played professional cricket, semi-professional cricket. And so that helped me and develop my skills in, in dealing with everyone and feeling mm-hmm. confident and okay. not feeling like I needed to stick to my own people, which helped. Uh, apart from that, I run my own recruitment company. I have a couple of other ventures. So there's a few businesses I run and that's where I come from. Okay. Interesting, you mentioned about uh, cricket. So you played semi-professional cricket. Who, did you, who was it you played for? Langshit Academy. Okay. So I've obviously being in a, in, a, in a sports background, it's like when you go into play for, for, for a team, for example, there's a lot of structure and rules and there's a lot of culture that's non non-Asian, non-Muslim. Yeah. So I would say that um, for me, like when I, w- I still remember this actually, like we'd play cricket basically, right? Yeah. And so I would play with adults, even when I was like 15, 16, right? I'd be in like, and there were many things like, you know, of course, like everyone would be drinking alcohol, everyone would be in the pub, everyone would be doing what they had to do. You know, even small things like the, the even the jokes, for example, or mm. even for example, going like, for example, for an Asian kid who's 14, 15, yeah. uh, a, a man who's 30, 40 years old having a shower right like there next to you, whilst you're just sitting there quietly th- looking down and thinking, I can't look up, I can't look up, you know, but that is... It's it's very odd, but that's actually very normal in a in a sports environment, right? Everyone's like the lads are just going in for the showers, you know, towels half around their waist, mm. sort of thing. So that's very very odd for me when I was growing up. I'm not saying it's I'm used to it now. It's normal now because obviously it's not something that I do anyway. But the point is, you become used to culture and how things work, yeah. um, which does help. From that, then did you? How did you get into where you are now? What did you do? So um, okay, so I mean. I, I basically went to university um, more because it was, it seemed as if that was the route to success. If you want to be wealthy, mm-hmm. rich or anything like that, then you have to go to university. Apparently, that's not true, by the way. Just disclaimer. <laughs> um, but um, I went to university. I wanted to be a police officer. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't obviously become a police officer, but that's what I wanted to do. I very quickly realized in second year of uni 
that my skills, what I was good at was in essence sales. Mm -hmm. I was good at talking. I was good at speaking to people. Uh, even when I was young, I would just, you know, I, I felt confident and comfortable speaking to people. That helped me. And so I realized like, that's my best skill. So I have to use that if I'm going to get anywhere in life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that in second year of uni, I realized that I had to um, basically get into sales or a role where I will have to talk. And to be fair, this is actually advice to anyone. Like people will decide to do something because their cousin's doing it, their brother's doing it, their uncle, or their dad or something like that. But they won't think to themselves, actually, what's my best skill? You know, it's very important to understand, reflect what's your best skill and then try to enhance that. In essence, that's what I did. So um, I got a job in recruitment. So I worked in recruitment for mm -hmm. um, six years. I worked out in Dubai for a short time, worked in various different companies in the UK. Alhamdulillah, you know, I ended up doing quite well. And basically five years, when I was about 25, I set up my own recruitment company. Just because honestly, it got to a point where I was making money, mm -hmm. according to what society says, but it didn't feel like I was making money. And I just felt like I was limited and there was a ceiling over my head. And so that's when I decided to set up my own company. Okay, so when you set up your own company, what kind of struggles did you face initially? And was there any hindrance towards it? Like you thought when you started, it was like, okay, maybe it's not the right thing to do. You know what? You'd be like, I generally, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Honestly speaking, like a lot of people actually ask me like, look, like, you know, how hard was it? What were the struggles that you went through? And because the assumption is anyone that starts a business has to go through a struggle. Yeah. Right. Reality was it wasn't that wasn't my case. Alhamdulillah, like I didn't actually go through any struggles in the beginning. Right? It was actually quite um, easy from the avenue that, and I would say there's an element because I had past experience within the exact same area that I wanted to set up my business, that it was quite easy, to be honest. I mean, my first client, I still remember, um, the first month after I left my job, I wasn't really working hard. Me and one of my friends who I basically said to my friend, I'll teach you recruitment, come on board, and I'll give you like a very high commission structure, basically. Mm. And so he joined me. And honestly, we would just bang FIFA like for like a month straight, right? And then just so I felt like I was being a little bit productive, I would send like three, four emails. Yeah. So I wasn't even like the first month trying. And then one client by email came back to me and said, by the way, we do need people, we need your services. And I was like, oh, okay. And that's actually how I got my first placement. I wasn't even trying. And then when I got some success, I was like, no, listen, I need to put my head down and I really can make this something. So let me try it. And that's basically how it happened. Okay. So when you was when you just started the company, were you still working your job or did you leave? No, no, I did leave. Okay. I left. Yeah, yeah. So you left and then you started working in the business. Obviously, some people might struggle with doing that because they need to make ends meet, yeah. you know, uh -huh. and they, they can't leave their job. And, you know, there's no right or wrong way. You can still, you can work your job and start your business or mm -hmm. you can completely leave it and start your business at the same time. You just get a bit more time directly to your business. But yeah, like, you know what it is, man? Like, I just felt like... Um, I'm a terrible saver. I can't save money. Yeah. Honestly speaking, one of the main reasons I set up a company for myself and tried to make more money is because I couldn't save money. And I tried saving for like two years, right? I, and you know, there were some months I would make like, basically I was making around 70, 80 grand a year working the recruitment job. Yeah. Um, so, you know, about three and a half, four grand basically. And honestly, I, I, I found it very hard to save. Uh, more because, you know, I would love eating out. I would love going out. I would love still having like, uh, by fun, just going out with my friends and having yeah, food, yeah. right? Um, so I couldn't save. And so I was like, well, if I can't save, the only way for me to save money or keep money or have money in my bank account is for me to make more. But, you know, I was working very hard working in recruitment. I would see a lot of commission in terms of like, you know, on, uh, for example, a 75 to 80 one month. But then I would not, that would not reflect in my pay because of deductions, for example. Mm -hmm. Going back to that same question, when you left, so you had some savings or you didn't? How did you, because you mentioned I, that. Honestly, I had a thousand pound in my bank account. Okay. So yeah, yeah, it's well quoted. I've mentioned this many a times on my social media. I genuinely had a thousand pound in my bank account. And the, the, the crazy thing about this is that I actually got married the same month I started my company. Okay. So not only, so you know, some brothers be like, oh, I need to be like financially settled. And yeah. Listen, listen, I had a thousand pound in my bank account. I got married and, you know, bro, that was it. I just, you know, I knew that I had to make things work. And by the way, 
I had this is also very interesting. I had promised my wife Hajj basically, yeah, which was going to be six months after for her mahr basically, yeah, and I didn't have ten grand in essence because two people five grand each. It's yeah. going to be ten grand at a thousand pound. But I genuinely believed in myself too. If I have my own recruitment company, I can make it. And so I needed to make ten grand. When I say ten grand, I mean ten grand not after I've spent everything, but saved yeah. in like five months. Alhamdulillah, we went hajjah that year. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I mean, it's about the conviction that you have in yourself. Of course. So yes. Anything, you know, it can be possible. And obviously there's Baraka in the marriage. Yeah, of course, equal. because because your wife also brings her own money. You know, there is Baraka in the marriage, marriage as well. And it's also to remember, bro, like, look, at the end of the day, it's well quoted again, but I, I started my company um, with the view for me to get closer to my religion and closer to Allah yeah. That's actually one of the main reasons I started my own company. And so there wasn't an ounce in my heart where I doubted the fact that I would not be able to make it work. Because mm-hmm. I knew my intentions were for that reason. You wanted a bit more time to come out of the business. Because if you was working the job, yeah. you won't have time. So you might not even get prayers time and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, the prayer times, of course, are very important. And being just able to pray in peace, right? I'll give you an example. Have you worked a job? Yeah. Okay. It's not a corporate job. Not a corporate job, but you've worked a job. Like at least 40 hours a week is what I'm asking. Okay. So when you went in the morning or when you came in home in the evening, that week, I just want you to think about that week, right? How much time did you have to think when you're working that job, basically? Not a lot. It's come home tired. That's it. And this is the thing that... In our religion, uh, the scholars actually speak about this and they call it tadabur, reflection basically. Yeah. And they say that th- like a third of your time should be spent in reflection, right? And so, you know, like reflecting is super powerful. And by the way, this isn't just an Islamic thing. Actually, it's, it's, it's wide scaled that reflecting on your life, on your blessings, on, you know, how much is going good for you, uh, you know, where you want to be in your life, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. It's super powerful, yet most people are unable to do it because they're working a job. That sounds crazy, but if you're working 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the evening, you come home at 7 o'clock, you go sleep at 9, 10 o'clock because you go to work next day. When are you thinking? You don't think. Yeah. So in your situation, you was working 40 hours a week as well, right? Of course, I point. was working 60 yeah. hours, my brother. So when did you get the time to think then? <laughs> well, I didn't. This is the thing. And so when then I left my job to then have my own business and had my all of a sudden I had this time where I was thinking and honestly, it was like my mind opened up. Mm. Genuinely speaking, everything that I speak about now, if you spoke to me when I was working a job, I would say this guy is, honestly, he's lying. He's not, he's not being, you know, he, he's complete. I don't agree with him at all. The same me, when I was working a job, I wouldn't agree with myself. But then when I left my job and I started something and I could think clearly, it was like I wasn't thinking fuzzy anymore. But there must, must have been something for you inside yourself for you to actually leave the job because a lot of people would be in the same situation, but they won't ever leave their jobs. Yeah, so... I don't know if um, it's probably not going to go down with the viewers right now, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I decided to leave my job. One of the main reasons I decided to, uh, there were two parts to why I left my job. I'll tell you both. One was actually uh, my father seemed to be, um, it, it seemed like he was, he, he could have been unwell, basically, mm-hmm. right? Uh, he was going through some health issues. Uh, I don't think the viewers would have an issue with this story, but uh, basically I went to the hospital with him, you know. It, it, I needed to be with him for like a week or two weeks yeah. and my, my managers started getting a bit iffy about the whole situation yeah. in the sense where they were like look when you're coming back to work uh, and that was definitely a, a light bulb moment in my head where I was like do I really want to continue working somewhere where I can't even serve my father who raised me to where I am today yeah. right definitely got me thinking a certain way and then there was a point basically where I was probably making about I think it was about, for example, it was about 50 grand, okay? And one month I made like a lot of commission and I'm looking forward to this paycheck. I'm thinking, oh, this is it. Finally, the moment where I'm going to save a ton of money because I've made a lot of money this month, for example, right? So the pay slip comes and Queen Lizzie's probably taken like 50% basically, right? And I'm looking at that like, what? Like I was assuming this and I got this. I was like, this isn't even worth it. Like this is one of the best months I've had. Yeah. And I've got X amount, right? I've been taxed so much. I was like, no, I have to do something for myself. And that's basically the two reasons why I, uh, why I was like, no, I need to do something for myself now. So when you had that light bulb moment that you mentioned, so at that point, did you feel like you were just 
another number in the business and you wasn't like you didn't like how you were being treated or what do you No, I don't to be honest with you, I've been a realist always. Yeah. I mean if anyone thinks that oh the company loves them and the manager loves them and you know like if they left everyone would be upset and you know like that just it doesn't happen. Mm. You 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 are replaceable. Yeah. If you're replaceable within a company no one cares. And no matter how nice your your work colleagues and everything like that reality is are fine. Your work colleagues might like you and they might miss you but two weeks later they won't care that you've left. Right? Mm-hmm. So I I was always a realist in terms of like I don't think my work colleagues like look I my work colleagues are nice we work friends we have a laugh and a giggle two days later i probably won't even think about you though you know so i i'm definitely a realist from that avenue yeah in terms of what well, you mentioned so you worked and you got that commission and then 50% of it was taken away yeah what would be different for the viewers that don't know what would be different if you was in a business and you were making that kind of money like what would you be able to do without saying too much <laughs> yeah yeah of course i guess it depends where your business is yeah. right Uh, if it's in in the UK of course yeah you, you know they're looking to corporation taxes going up it might get a little bit techy yeah. but uh, look i think the point the the issue the way i saw it at that point irrespective of tax okay yeah. now of course it could be it it, it is uh, you know it can be more tax efficient for you if you've got your own company okay without going into the detail now that's not the main reason at that point why i decided to do something for myself obviously when you're working a recruitment job you get paid commission like 10% of what you actually make for the company. Mm-hmm. So the company keeps 90%, right? Yeah. So I was probably making like half a million for the company. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I was seeing you know 50 60k plus my basic. So I wasn't see- and then so I, you know it felt like man I'm making these guys so much money and I'm making 50 60. So it just didn't seem like a fair deal. So at that point I knew I had to do something for myself for for me to actually see the good numbers basically. Mm-hmm. Your recruitment company then what is it that you done differently from what you was doing in your job? Is there kind of any kind of like way that you thought okay this is how I want to do my recruitment business and this is how I'm going to elevate it to that point? No, I don't think there was a, I don't think it was like where I thought oh, oh let me do things completely different now I can do this now I can mm-hmm. do that. I think look there's definitely an element of you know you're not looking over your shoulder to what your manager will say for example. Yeah. You can focus on certain parts of the role because you know when you're working a corporate job as such you're expected to hit certain targets uh, irrespective of what will actually bring you the money. Mm-hmm. So for example, um I say this a lot. I say when you're doing business for example in the beginning chase the money don't chase things that aren't going to make you money yeah. and so making a website or business cards or you know leaflets or random random stuff that's not actually going to make you specific money directly right but in other scenarios you need to go directly to the money and close the gap between you and the money as much as you can yeah and so that's in essence what i was doing with recruitment that i wasn't able to do working a job because you're still expected to hit your targets so i would say i was reducing the gap basically Say so, let's say you've chased the money now. What were you doing different? Why are you doing differently now? Have you got to that point yet? Or yeah, obviously, like I think it was. Um, you know, it's it's interesting actually. Like I don't, I don't know how the viewers are going to take this, but I was actually so something clicked basically, right? Because what happened is uh, I started the company in October, and by January, I think Alhamdulillah, we you know probably did about six seven grand a month basically, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so I was like. like 6 grand like a month and it's only been 3 months that's crazy right yeah. now so even i was i was definitely taken back i didn't think you know i would see that sort of success that quickly but you know the fact that i was able to get an office the fact that because i started from my living room right yeah. uh, i started right from the you know started from the bottom really and then moved to the offices and then it became a thing of well if i can do 6 7 grand and if i actually work hard and properly maybe i can make you know more basically mm-hmm. um and close to that period to be fair i just came across a video and it was actually a video of grant cardone um and you know you, you know i remember him saying something like yeah, you guys need to 10x your money you know 10x this that i'm like what's this guy on about man so anyway i listened to him and though some things are obviously like waffle some things are actually true in what he says yeah. you know he, there's a reason he is where he is and there's a re- look, anyone says Uh, if you if you are not making the sort of money he's making it doesn't make sense to criticize him yeah. to such an extent 
I have to be honest. So like, anyway, he said some points and I was like, man, this guy's right. Like, why don't I just work hard? It doesn't make sense. I'm not working hard. Mm. So honestly, a uh, video helped. I started working hard and then I started, you know, reading more books, listening to more people, trying to, you know, and yeah. Okay. Was that when you started your business or before? Uh, when I started my business. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, education knowledge is quite helpful and it can help a lot of people before mm -hmm. they start their business. Mm -hmm. But obviously you'd already had that drive to start your business anyway. You didn't need, yeah. need that. But if you got it after, it's better than nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so when you got, you said you got your office, uh, so did you hire staff? Yes. How many staff have you got? So currently we're actually, um, well, I'll just tell you now to be fair. So currently we're actually moving from the UK to Dubai. Okay. So just because of that, the staff that we had, are no longer with the company okay. and we'll be hiring in Dubai. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go through mass hiring in Dubai. Uh, one, because labor is much cheaper in Dubai. Yep. Uh, two, because, well, King Charles isn't gonna take half my money. Uh, and three, you know, it's just, there's a lot of potential in Dubai as well. So we're basically, inshallah, moving to Dubai come January, February time. Okay, so how many staff did you have previously when you was? So at the peak, we probably had about seven, eight, seven, eight employees. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so is there anything that you did to treat them differently in terms of them being in a corporate job? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, to be fair, look, the environment was always good for Muslims. Yeah. And that I, I sort of, um, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of that because I think that sometimes as Muslims, we become a little bit scared. Uh, you know, a lot of Muslims are actually scared to even ask their managers whether they can pray. Mm -hmm. A fact, by the way, it's reality. Uh, and so I definitely wanted an environment where, you know, going to Friday prayers wasn't an issue. You know, going for two hours was fine because it was Friday prayers. Yeah. Uh, praying Jummah in Dohra and Asr and stuff, it was fine. It was, I mean, it's, it's part of your life. And so you shouldn't have to feel like it's a massive chore. So yes, from that side, it was definitely different. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, I, look, there's no point reinventing the wheel. And clearly yeah. if I was working for a recruitment company that was making millions a year, if I just mimicked that, then you know, why reinvent the wheel when they were clearly doing well. But of course, the culture was different because yeah. um, for the Muslims, and they were non-Muslims as well hired, uh, for the Muslims, it was just a nicer, ni it, was, it was nicer for them. Mm -hmm. So do you think if you was just, obviously, inshallah, scale in the future further and your recruitment business became maybe not the size of the other business that you was working in, but similar, do you think you'd be able to maintain the culture throughout it? Or do you think it would get lost because... Um, yeah, of course, like, look, I think it's just the culture is, I don't tend to focus on culture too much, mm -hmm. but it's like, as long as, um, a Muslim who wants to pray knows that he will be, uh, you know, somewhat praised for praying as such, right? Because I will be there praying as well. Yeah. So the fact that any Muslim feels like they are comfortable and confident enough to pray, I think is a good enough thing and the culture is if you're talking about culture outside that yeah. then i think that is that is um you know a result of who you hire yeah right so look if i now because i'm not saying that i'm just going to hire muslims right that, that's i don't think that's the right way to go either um having said that i would want a muslim you know individual to feel like he can pray and and though by the way Generically speaking, Muslims can pray in a working environment and that's never really an issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is more the fact that Muslims tend to be scared to ask. Yeah. Right? And they feel like they're scared and they don't want to ask that question because they will feel judged. That's reality. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. Okay, so obviously you say you're kind of like an advocate for Muslims coming into the culture, Western culture and environment. Mm -hmm. So if someone was in your position before working in a job and let's say they did ask their boss, can I pray? And they said no, or they didn't give them much time and they were being like iffy about it. What would you, what would you say to that person then? And they like, they don't really have any business ideas. I don't know, like, what do you Wait, think? so, so ask that question again. So is this for, sorry, say, ask that question So this is a Muslim person okay. working in a corporate environment okay. and they've actually asked for, you know, prayer or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. and they've maybe been granted it or not granted it but not to that level where they're comfortable and they are allowed to freely pray yeah i think i think look the reality is um the reality is this is even if we take away the prayer culture is as such that it will be uncomfortable for you 
in some situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say, let's say the prayer is the most obvious, right? Yeah, yeah. But let's look at Christmas parties, for example. Yeah, it's company culture, and for you not to go to a Christmas party is a little bit odd. You're now being, you know, the odd person in the company, right? Yeah. So, but you can't go to the Christmas party. Uh, Friday pubs, right? Yeah. Going to the pub on Fridays and, you know, whilst everyone has alcohol and you have orange juice. And again, I've quoted this many times, but one, it's not something that Muslims can do. So it's not just about the prayer. It's actually just, it is actually that take the good in terms of the experience and, you know, what you want to do. But I think it's important for anyone Irrespective of whether you're a Muslim or not, but I think it's important for anyone to thrive for more and thrive to be, you know, in charge of their own decisions. And I, th- I find it a little bit sad mm-hmm. that you have to ask someone whether you can pray or not. Yeah, I do find that sad. Yeah, that's interesting. But I mean, do you not think there's nothing wrong if someone wants to live that, let's say, comfortable life? They they, they don't want to, you know. I think it doesn't. I think when someone says that I don't mind living that life. Do you yeah. mean by comfortable life? You mean like, like just, work, just working a corporate job and good. not having any aspirations? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why? Why would someone want to do that? Hmm. I guess they don't want to try. Try hard. Well, they just, that, that's exactly yeah. what it is. They don't. But it doesn't make sense why you want to. Let's say there's an individual who says no, but I like my. I, I want to go job. I work and I like my job. And I don't want to. I don't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine. So, you are, um, you know, in essence, you are. Um, your manager or your director or your job is what you are um, they're in charge of you mm-hmm. uh, they increase your salary they increase your money uh, you're limited by them uh, in essence you cannot take time off whenever you want you're limited to what 25 holidays you've got 365 days in, in a year and you're limited to 25 holidays or 20 holidays many companies by the way you know, uh, you want to travel to a different country and live in a different country. Well, you can't because you're working a job, right? There are so many issues. So all I say, I'm not saying now no one should work a job. That's not what I say. No, I say work a job, do it, but try to do something for yourself because you can't turn around to me and say, no, no, but I'm happy. Well, how do you know when you've never tried to something better? Like how, mm. how can it be where you're actually saying, no, I don't even want to try like you're saying to someone Look, try Who knows Something might work out for you yeah. And the person says Nah, 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 nah that. Why? It doesn't make sense Yeah You know? Okay, so For anyone watching Obviously this is like Quite cliche You know, like people They want to start a business They want to do something And I get a lot of people Messaging me as well Like asking for help And it's like What would you What would you advise someone? You know The main things that people say Like I don't have money You know mm-hmm. I don't have any like contacts mm-hmm. kind of thing. Like, what would you advise someone starting off? What's the best route for them to go down? Okay, so two things. One, if uh, this two of the biggest issues I find, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are uh, one, I, I don't have enough money, and second, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I don't know what to do is probably one of the biggest things, right? So now, if someone doesn't have money, I would say, look, start a service-based business because when you're providing a service-based business, in essence, you're not actually having to spend a lot of money, mm-hmm. a couple of hundred at max. Yeah. You can start a service-based business. Second, I don't know what to do, okay? Rather than coming to me and asking me and saying, I don't know what business idea to do. Every person's situation is different, right? You might be good at something. How am I meant to know what you're good at, for example, right? Have you even gone on the internet and just typed in business ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that, like, say, for example, you type in the top 100 business ideas, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not the fact that those 100 business ideas, out of those 100, you're going to find one that you're going to do. That's not the thing. But the thing is, you're thinking about it. You're trying to come up with an idea. You're trying to research different things. Most people will not even try to come up with an idea. They'll sit there and say, "Mm, but I don't have an idea. Right, okay. Have you even spent half an hour a week to try and think of one? Uh, No, I haven't. So... I don't understand like why uh, th- there's this misconception that a business idea will randomly come to you, yeah. you randomly start it, and you randomly make money. Random doesn't exist. Like you have to put some effort in. And so if I now today spent three hours a week, for example, trying to think of a business idea, I can I promise you six months later, guaranteed, I will have a very good business idea. Because mm. I'm just trying to think of something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I guess, yeah, people don't... You know, they don't put that time in. They'll want all the answers straight to them, but it's not straightforward as that. Yeah. 
I would probably say like, you know, a lot of people say that you do what you're good at or some find something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So in terms of yourself, when you started, when you was in uni, so you, what course did you do by the way? Criminal, criminology. Okay. So how did you get to recruitment? Was that, it like that's what I'm saying. So like when I was in university, I wanted to get into policing, okay. right? I don't ask me why, but I thought I'd become a detective basically. I, yeah. thought, I, was, I thought I was sick. Eh? <laughs> but um, then I realized that sales or speaking, communicating was basically my better skill as such. Mm -hmm. And I knew if I enhanced that and if I used that, I would do all right. So mm. that's basically you just why. Like, so you chose recruitment from that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, well, the story actually goes back when I was 18 years old, when I was in college, when I was 18, I think I was 17 actually, there was a recruitment consultant or he was in recruitment basically. And uh, I was, you know, even at that age, I was quite cheeky and I was quite chirpy. So he came to me and he said, you would do quite well in recruitment, right? Mm. And he would drive like some big Range Rover and everyone was like, wow, this guy's got money, right? Mm. Um, and so that kind of stuck in my head. So in second year of uni, then when I realized that, no, actually I talk well, I communicate well, that's my skill. Then I thought, well, I remember he used to do recruitment and he had a Range Rover. So clearly they might be doing all right. That's, that's where I decided to research and do that. Obviously you mentioned your skills are speaking to people and communicating. Mm -hmm. So is that one of the reasons why you are like quite prominent on social media now and you focus on that? Is that something you focus on a lot, like 50-50 with the actual business? Or like, is it something you focus on more now? Yeah, I think social media is, um, is very powerful. I'm sort of in my, the sort of place I am in my life now, I don't actually, I don't know if I want to say this, but I, I don't actually have to work as such. Mm -hmm. So I only do it now because, you know, keep myself busy. I like to do more. I want to progress. I want to grow. So I don't work for money necessarily anymore. I work because... Uh, I enjoy it. I want to keep growing and, you know, I want to open up opportunities for people. So social media is a great place because obviously it, it enables me to help a lot of people. One video gets, you know, 10,000 views and now you've actually maybe helped three people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about helping 10,000 people. Actually, it's about helping two or three people. Um, and I know when I was growing up, I didn't really have an older figure who was like a role model, who was a Muslim and wasn't a snowflake about his religion. And actually would tell you as it is, but knew how to run businesses as well. Very hard to find, by yeah. the way. Right. And so honestly, man, I'm just trying to be the older brother to the younger generation where it's like, oh, he is a Muslim. He won't sacrifice his religion. Mm -hmm. And actually we can respect that from the avenue that he is also trying to do well for himself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Muslims don't have to be poor. And this is a mindset that unfortunately sometimes is embedded into our heads when we're young that, oh, money is bad. It's not bad. Some of the Sahaba were very, very wealthy. And so... Mm -hmm. That's the reason I am very prominent on social media now, so, or I try to put some content out because I know it benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so have you had like any feedback like for yourself? You must have seen a lot of people reaching out to you in terms of what you've put out. You know what the reality is? What I talk about is against society. Mm. What I talk about is against society because I say the schooling system is best. There's no point, honestly, like, what, what does school teach you? School, college, university, it teaches you how to get the best job possible. Yeah. That's what it teaches you, right? Does it teach you how to do your taxes? The first time you find out about taxes when you're 21, 22 years old and you get a pay slip. That's when you find out about tax, unless you're doing accounting. Ridiculous, by the way, because that's probably one of the biggest things in your life, right? So majority of the things I say are against society. I say, don't buy a house and don't put all your money into a house. Mm. I say, don't take out a mortgage. So... A lot of the things I get a lot of backlash and I'm completely okay with that yeah. because the things that I say, um, you know, are not in agreement with society, though the 10 and 15%, for example, that see the content and think, I think he's got a point to be fair, mm -hmm. can understand. And I, I'm completely fine with that. Okay. So... It's sort of the backlash you get. Do you ever respond to that? <laughs> oh. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. I'll be honest, like, you know, sometimes I have a good laugh with it. So sometimes I have to be honest, like, sometimes someone will say something, you know, and I will just give them a little cheeky comment back. So, ah, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I like, I like a little bit of backlash. So I, this is the funny thing. So my brother, actually, this is interesting, right? So my brother, like, he will see my videos and stuff like that. And he's very, like, I want to say protective, but, like, if I've made a video, so me and my brother, we agree on everything. I mean, he's actually 12 years older than me. Okay. But... Um, he agrees with everything that I say. And now he's later on in his life, he's worked the job, he's done everything. He's like, man, I can't believe, why would you work a job? 
but I tell you this much as well. When you're 21, 22, 23, you'll disagree with me, right? When you're 30, 31, 32, you'll be like, right, that guy was right. You know why? Because you'll get married, you'll have kids, you'll have to pay your bills, you'll have to pay everything in your house. Unfortunately, our community, you're really sheltered when you're young and you really believe that X salary, I'm sorted. Right? And so um, going back to the comment of backlash, my brother gets very defensive. He'll be like, well, why is he saying that? I don't really care. Honestly, it doesn't matter because I complete, I ha the things I talk about, I have to respect and appreciate that people disagree. And look, it's embedded into society. If I'll tell you this, if, um, if what society says is right, if the norm is right, then surely everyone would be, ri everyone would be uh, rich, right? Yeah. But they're not. Hmm. Why is everyone struggling? So if the way of society and the norm and the middle class and the working class was the right way, why today is everyone struggling? Why, why, why are people two months away from being broke and not having any money in their accounts? And why do people only have a maximum of 1.6 times their salary in savings? Mm -hmm. Clearly there's an issue. Yeah. Right? Okay, so you mentioned about, in that, in that story you mentioned about you know how our communities are really tight knit, and you're really sheltered. Um, for as in, for us, for example, like a parent, like what would you, what would, what should we as a community ideally do differently for our children, and you know for the for the youth? I think we need to encourage. Uh, we definitely need to encourage entrepreneurship. Yeah. We definitely need to encourage our youth to go out and mingle with other cultures and societies. Yeah. Look for my child. If I wanted, you know, the child to, I'm talking about the aspect of dunya as such, right? Yeah. I don't actually want my children to achieve dunya. I yeah. want them to be a, uh, uh, people of, of the deen, really, mm -hmm. to be honest. But if I did, honestly, I would, I would give my two-year-old an iPad, right? Yeah. I would, um, you know, teach my two-year-old, you know, how to speak Arabic, uh, how to speak English, how to speak Urdu as well different languages mm -hmm. I would teach him the fact that actually I would teach him how to buy and sell sales in itself is I promise you if you can understand sales and learn sales how to actually sell and this isn't just like a lot of people actually think they're good salespeople and promise you they're not but if you can actually learn sales it's the biggest it's the best skill you can have better than any uni degree mm -hmm. genuinely okay maybe then not better than like the top uni degrees or whatever no but sales in itself being able to convince someone, being able to understand like how to make things work on yourselves and stuff like that. It's very powerful. And so I think, look, I think uh, education in terms of entrepreneurship and how, the socii how, how society works, how the world works, it's very important. Mm. It's also very important to have an education as well. Though I'm against the educational system, I think to a certain extent you do need it as well. So I don't say like you shouldn't go to, like, you know, you shouldn't do your GCSEs. Of course, like, look, there's an element of you need to have maths and English and science and you need to have a basic understanding of how life and education works. So yeah. there is that. But after a certain point, it can get a bit wasteful. Mm -hmm. OK, so you mentioned about um, going to Dubai, right? Yep. Is that for your like not just business, like for your personal life as well? Like you want your family to be there? In, in, in that, is, it, is it like that or is it just just for the business? Because obviously it is a Muslim country, so Muslim place rather than being here. Yeah, I think, I think me personally, I think Hijra is is very important for me. And by Hijra, like for anyone watching, is is basically moving to a land which is Islamic as such, mm -hmm. right? And someone will say, "Well, Dubai is not Islamic," <laughs> but um, uh, you know, it's 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 one. I would say, look, it's all about where you are in Dubai as well. Yeah. I think certain parts are actually quite uh, full of communities and stuff like that. I'm actually looking at Sharjah as well to live in uh, rather than the Dubai itself, but I might live in Dubai. The answer is yes. I definitely think it's a better lifestyle. Um, you know, let's be honest, do I really want my child at the moment growing up in certain parts of London, for example? Yeah. I'm closer to London, basically. So do I really want my child growing up? I mean, no. I mean, you know, I definitely wouldn't wear a nice watch. I got an Apple Watch on right now. I think even Apple Watch I might get robbed these yeah. days, you know, for an Apple Watch. So, look, I mean, Dubai is definitely safer. You know, the sun's out a lot more. It's it is an Islamic country, and so therefore, you know, there are a ton of masajids. My wife wears the niqab basically, niqab, 
And so um, it's definitely, I know, a lot more comfortable for her. Yeah. And so it's just little things that actually make a massive difference. You know, my wife can now, for example, go to an all-females beach. That's mm-hmm. not a problem. Yeah. They actually facilitate for stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She can actually go to a, a, a gym, which is all-females. Yeah. You know, and that's amazing. Like being able to actually, so these little things make a huge difference. Um, and yeah, man, for a Muslim, it does, it's nice. If, mm-hmm. if you can afford it and if you can, you know, look, have those luxuries, then yeah, it can be great. Yeah, I mean, just sounds like, why, why wouldn't you? Um, in terms of obviously business as well, what do you, why have you found different in terms of the business culture in this country and Dubai? Because I know, I've heard a lot of stories and I've, I know that it's a lot better there than here. So yeah. I guess the truth is, right, I'm not, I'm not too well rehearsed with Dubai because I haven't actually been there for too long. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, well, look, I'll ask you the question after this, but there are certain things that obviously are much better actually in, the, in England, yeah. right? Uh, for example, in terms of structure and things happening in terms of um, the functionality of the country actually is very good mm-hmm. with the UK. Like you can set up a company within two days. Yeah. Right? You can't do that in Dubai. You can't do that in UAE. Yeah. And so there are certain things that are actually much better in the UK. And we have to be, uh, we have to appreciate the fact that actually from certain parts in terms of functionality, the UK is very well advanced. Yeah. And because obviously UAE has seen money over the last 20, 25 years, for example, it's uh, been a massive rush. And sometimes you do see that lack and that um, gap between the functionality side. Um, but look, I would say this, if you look at just Dubai, right? In terms of how much money there is in Dubai in itself, just yeah. that area, basically, in terms of land, basically, it's probably one of the most wealthiest areas, if you think about it, in the whole world. Yeah. Like Dubai itself, just Dubai, right? So, okay, in business, we're always taught like you, you chase the money. So wherever the money is, you chase the money, right? If mm. today I charge, honestly, I could on a, I could open something up. I could ha- I could sell an ice cream in Dubai mm. for £50 for two scoops and it genuinely won't be frowned on if I sell it in the right and market in the right way. Yeah. Do you know how crazy that is? Yeah, no. Like I could sell an ice cream for two scoops and honestly, the cost price being like two pound, and I could sell it for fifty pound, and it genuinely in the right area, in the right space, in the right marketing, it won't be frowned on, and people will pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's true. Like, there's a lot of opportunity in the UK as well. Like, you know, we have to be appreciative of it. But in terms of, I'm thinking more of the people. So, I've mentioned this a lot of my podcasts and the guests I've had on, um, and generally the general consensus is a lot of people in this country they're very entitled. You know. And you'll see that in the working culture as well. Like you mentioned, you have, you go to Dubai and you're going to have your workers there and they're going to be cheaper labour. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. probably it's likely that they might... 10 times harder work. 10 yeah. times harder, exactly. Of course. Yeah, because look, uh, what? okay, I'll tell you this, right? Uh, the basic salary minimum, minimum I'm going to have to pay someone is like 19, 20 grand, right? Mm. Currently yeah. here. So that's going to cost me about 1,700, 1,700, 1,800 pounds, right? Yeah. Let's say 1,700 pounds it costs me. So one person is going to cost me £1,700, but the person I'm getting, right, without discriminating, is going to be the person who really like, you know, a 19, 20-year-old, 20 21-year-old who didn't go uni or did, didn't get maybe much of an education or is just starting in their job, yeah. right? Or is starting in their career as such. So I'm going to have to spend a lot of time training them, hope that they have a bit of a head screwed on them. Let's be honest, generically speaking, you know, like the 19, 20, 21 year old, you know, they might just leave three, four months later, six months later. You know what I mean? Yeah. There is that risk that, especially in the West, as someone who works in recruitment, I know the younger generation are the type, unfortunately, to jump around at the moment, right? In terms of their jobs. So, but what, you, what are you going to get in Dubai? You're going to get that same, you know, so, okay, what you could get away paying someone, let's say 3,500 dirhams, yeah. right? A month. You know, six, seven hundred pound a month, but that person is going to be very hard working. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, and that person probably will get six, seven times the same work done as the seventeen hundred pound. So, in terms of business, it really does make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Obviously, in Dubai as well, there's a lot of, um, this might be a bit of a controversial topic, but there's a lot. Of, obviously, you mentioned the people, they're hard working because they need to make ends meet. Yes. And there's a lot of, bad things that happen and people get treated really badly there. Yep. So what's your what's your views on that? And like, are you comfortable being in that kind of environment? I think I think it's not necessarily, you see, it's, it's when you say get treated badly, right? It's also about 
understanding where these people have, for example, come from. Yeah. So uh, these people are my people, right? They're from yeah. Pakistan. I'm from yeah. Pakistan. In fact, I go to Pakistan every year, so I'm not a coconut sort of guy. Like yeah. I actually go to Pakistan a lot. I know these guys, right? Now, in for example, the village or certain areas of Pakistan, there's a lot of poverty. Mm-hmm. Okay, a lot of poverty. Now, when these guys go to Dubai, for example, or go to UAE, it's very hot. Like hundred percent, it's very difficult, very hard. But they do make a decent amount compared to what they will make in Pakistan. So, for example, the average salary in Pakistan is forty thousand. I would say. I mean, when I say average, that's probably on the high end. Forty thousand rupees a month, mm. which works out to be about a hundred and thirty to hundred and forty pound, and that is like a corporate office job. Yeah, hundred thirty to hundred forty pound. So then, when you're going to Dubai as a labourer, mm. basically, and you're making four hundred, five hundred pound, let's say on the lowest end. Yeah, right. Actually, for for someone who's a labourer now, it's they're seeing the financial gain from it, mm. right? And so now, when you compare that person to someone in the UK, of course, like that person is going through a lot of hardship, yeah. a lot of struggles. But that person themselves might actually be very happy in that situation, and they're like, "Look, I'm so glad like I've got this because mm-hmm. I can look after my family, yeah. and I'm making four times what I would make in Pakistan, for example." Yeah. What, what are you comparing it to? If you compare it to the UK, then yes. If you compare it, but then look, you know, it, it's the same way. Now things are more expensive in the in in the UK, right? Yeah. But they can be in certain areas of the bay and actually be quite comfortable like for example in certain areas in Dubai it's much cheaper than the UK like you can get like uh, apartments for like what five six hundred pound a, a month mm-hmm. you know what I mean so yeah it's it's it, it's subjective I would say okay um, you know they're, 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 they're well off like not well off but like they're comfortable in their place where they are and obviously in comparison it can be quite different um, so obviously now you're gonna to go to you're gonna to go to Dubai and you look at expand. So are you looking to hire a lot of people? Like, what's yeah, your sure. like ultimate goal for it? Or like, are you trying to, you know, create the, some opportunities or? What do you I think? guess the ultimate, the ultimate goal. Okay, so the ultimate goal is um, it's a difficult one because even I don't know. Yeah. So I was actually having this conversation with a friend of mine yesterday. And I was saying that the truth is, right, I I don't actually know, I don't actually have goals. Honestly speaking, I don't actually have goals anymore. Like I am completely, I, I enjoy what I do, which is trying to make a business successful or trying to start a company. I enjoy it. I honestly enjoy it. And so I don't really have goals. I just, I'm just enjoying what I do. Mm-hmm. It's like, honestly, some people say to me like, oh, when are you going to stop, for example? Or when's enough, right? Yeah. And I say, that question is like going to someone and saying, when are you going to stop playing Friday night football? Yeah. I don't know. Like, I just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. I, so I don't, I don't work because I want a lot of money. I don't work. Now, I want to create opportunities for people. Mm-hmm. I want to give a lot of charity. I want to help a lot of people. And I want to make a big difference, yes. But I do what I do because I enjoy it. And that really helps me turn up every single day. I'm able to do what I do and I'm turn up every single day. Just like, I love to be able to start something from nothing, make it a success and know that I uh, made it a success and potentially sell it. Okay. So yeah, in terms of charity, um, which I mentioned a lot as well, is there anything that you're looking to do in the future? But obviously like, even that people that want to do charity, you can give whatever you have, but even doing like big things like, you know, like building masks, building suits and stuff, it requires money. And you know you need to you need to have that money to be able to do that kind of thing. So, is there anything that you're thinking of doing, or that you are in the process? There are, there are, of course, there are many things that I, there are many things that I have in my head. Yeah. That I don't, I don't share. Like even my wife doesn't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, I, it's funny because many a times, sometimes we have like you know, like you have those deep chats with your wife, right? So, are you married? So you don't know. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you have those deep chats with your wife and my wife always says like, she's like, sometimes it's like you open another door in from your head and you t- you let me in on a little bit. There's a lot that goes on in my head. Like to be honest with you, on social media is probably only like 10% of it. And yeah. not to say I'm some mad extremist or something, like I'm not. Yeah. But it's just to say that like, sometimes some things are better kept like private and in yeah, your head yeah. as well. And so yes, of course, like in terms of like, there are many things that I want to do on a larger scale. Um, one could say maybe they are goals, right? Um, but changing, look, 
I'll tell you this. Today, if um, Alan Sugar, he tweets something, yeah, does it get recognized? Sometimes. It does get recognized yeah. sometimes, right? <laughs> Maybe he says something about, for example, um, you know, a certain religion, or oh, he says yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. It gets yeah. recognized, right? Yeah. Okay, so the point is, is when you get to a certain point of, of money and fame, etc., etc., you can either use that towards a negative or you can use it towards a positive. Mm-hmm. And let's just say we need someone or people rather to use uh, what, you know, a, what Allah Azza wa has gifted us and blessed us with in terms of the dunya to use it in the right way. Yeah. How many Muslims do you know, for example, you could look at and be like, wow, this guy's a billionaire, man, and he's doing bits with the Muslims. Yeah. I can't think of anyone, to be honest. It might be someone, I just can't think of someone. Yeah. But the point is, is we need, we need people like that. Being an entrepreneur, right, you'll focus on your goals and your dreams and aspirations, try to become successful. But a lot of people, I know, <coughs> sorry, a lot of people will obviously focus on themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. But many people will go into a direction where they'll stop caring about those in need, those that are poor, you know, and that's how the rich become rich. And they, don't, they have the elitist mentality and they yeah. only care about themselves and the people around them. Yeah. And they don't care about the people that are not doing so well for whatever reason it may be so do you think that you know we should we need to make a change towards that and it's something that you are trying to advocate for or yeah i think but again like you know the truth is uh, look man i could give someone uh, i think education is very important yeah i think education from the avenue of the right education is very important yeah. because i could give you a hundred pound but how you spend it now you yeah. m- might not have a hundred pound now uh, you know next day yeah. But if I can, some like if the educate the right education is there, and I give you twenty pound, that might turn into two hundred pound two weeks later. Yeah, and so the right education is important with then the right resources. So I think that's kind of where I'm starting with, mm-hmm. with the right education, because you have to give the right education and in, and empower the people and teach them how to work things and make them help them and you know that sort of thing. And so honestly, I love like. Um, like you know, I'm I'm planning on inshallah in November holding free events, like yeah. just free events, just meeting a ton of people yeah. and helping a ton of people, um, just because I know that there's such a need of it. Uh, just because you know, sometimes one message, like I told you about that Grant Cardone thing, yeah, that one video which was probably like five minutes, and he's said it like a thousand times, right? Yeah. But that really helped, man. Like genuinely, it actually helped, and you know, today, you know maybe that helped and even even if it helped one percent so if you can help like one person one percent and they go on to achieve something that's powerful yeah i guess yeah so because if you even if you have like you said the free events or whatever um you know you have like your courses and stuff um even if you make that one change they might become you know similar to what you're doing and they might further the message and eventually that will create the change and you know that's been the catalyst for it so what kind of other stuff are you are you doing at the moment? So you, you have a recruitment course, right? Is it- yeah, so obviously I've got my recruitment company. Yeah. That's the bread and butter yeah. that I've had for five years. What I found is when I was making content around everything, people were like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And I said, well, I have a recruitment company. How do you start a recruitment company? Can you tell us, yeah. right? <laughs> Honestly. And that question really stresses me out sometimes because it's like, I can't just tell someone in 10 minutes how to start a recruitment company. It's not possible, yeah. right? So it's like saying to you, like, honestly, it's like someone started a business. It took them five years to get to where they are. And someone just says, how? Tell me in 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm not meant to do that. But yeah, it's not possible. So uh, basically, I said, look, you know what? Let me just create a recruitment course. Let me just teach people how to start a recruitment company. And if they're interested, they can take it. And if they're not, then no problem, right? Um, so I created that. Alhamdulillah, to be fair, there was a very positive response. Mm-hmm. A lot of people were interested. I think, I guess it's just like, People do want a way out. People do want an opportunity. And if you teach them how to do it, they're actually really willing to try. Yeah. And we've had, honestly, like a lot of people make a lot of success, even where I was surprised. Like, honestly, it's, so it's 18 hours. It's not small. So, you know, it's like, you know, when someone asks you, like, how do you start a recruitment company? How am I meant to answer it in 10 yeah. minutes when it's taken me 18 hours to answer it, basically? Is it like 18 hours worth of like video content or like? Yeah, pure video. Me sitting in front of a camera talking as okay, well. Okay. So none of that, none of that, like, presentation you don't know who's talking behind like is it someone else no 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 it's me sitting in front of a camera talking for 18 hours and explaining the whole start to end basically right um but the point is is um yeah so then you know i created that basically alhamdulillah we've had a good positive response from that 
And then I created just recently, six months ago, a platform called Teach You, very early stages, We're testing the waters right now. Um, proof of concept is there. It's doing well-ish. I, we haven't even shared it anywhere. It's basically, uh, think of it as the Netflix for courses. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I found is, unfortunately, on social media, uh, you be, the people that are selling courses are the ones that have a big following. Yeah. But actually, there's a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge and a lot of education to give. But on uh, that message isn't getting to the public mm -hmm. because they haven't got a following, yeah. right? So that's basically because I own a recruitment company. I thought, you know what? Let me go to the experts. I'll say to them, come on board. I'll pay you for your time. Teach what you know, and I'll host it on the platform. So that's Teach You. We started that about six, seven months ago. Doing all right, doing well. There's a lot of benefit from the. I mean, it's, it's basically 20 quid a month, right? Yeah. So the whole idea is you get all this knowledge for cheap, but it's like, you know, at least the experts are teaching it rather yeah. than anyone. Yeah. So I mean, it's beneficial for yourself as well. Like you'll put in, for example, like you said, your course. You put in the 18 hours once and yes. you can, it can be exponential if you wanted to. Like, I'm not sure it grows. And oh, for sure. Seven. And to be fair, that's actually where I was today, to be fair. But I could just leave it, right? Yeah. But honestly, I, that, that's just not the sort of person I am. So now, basically, what I'm doing is because I've got a lot of contacts and links in the recruitment game. So I, today, like I was with my director of, uh, you know, uh, basically, he was my director when I was work, working in recruitment. Mm -hmm. So he's been in the game for like 20 years. Yeah. He currently runs six recruitment companies. Okay. So I said to him, I'll pay you for your time and you better know it cost me a lot of money, <laughs> but you teach now. So basically I'm doing a recruitment 2.0 yeah. where the experts, so I have done it, I've started it, but I'm not the, I'm not like the best in all avenues of recruitment, right? Yeah. There's better people better than me. So I've gone to the best and I've said pay, like, I'm going to pay you for your time, teach what you know. And now he's taught like four or five hours of a big mm -hmm. part of it. And I will go to other people for five. So I'm making it even better now. Uh, but I've actually said to people, if you get the course now, then you can have it for free. So like, it's like, you, honestly, I just like like bettering things and growing yeah. things and making it even better. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're that kind of person that's interested in helping other people, it's like a no brainer. If you, especially if you've got the following, you've got the experience, yeah. you know, yeah. you've got it. And then that's it. You can, you can build from that. For sure. But being in the position, for example, that someone is looking to learn stuff, and you know Instagram there's a lot of bogus stuff yes. there there's a lot of bogus courses and you'll see that Instagram ads come up they'll try to get you to buy a course of course whatever it may be whatever industry whatever you're searching for that will come up yeah, yeah so being someone that's looking at that how would what would you say to someone that's looking to whatever business it is it doesn't have to be recruitment it could be anything um, they're looking to invest in themselves buy a course mm -hmm. uh, what would what, what, are the, what are the kind of things they should look out for in <sighs> I think it's stuff. important. I think honestly, one thing I would definitely look out for me personally, I would want the person to have their own social media following uh, in terms of when I say social media following, like I want to be able to like know this person yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So I can at least see like, oh, is he genuine? Like, is he nice? Like, does he talk about this stuff? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. bro, if I'm standing in front of Lambos and stuff and then yeah. I sell a course and stuff, then I'm not going to lie. Like that is a bit like, does he really know what he's talking about? Like, show me something where it's like, oh, he just, that was actually kind of cool. Like he just showed me how to do something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, for example, I've got like on my YouTube channel, I've got like live calling sessions. So I'm live calling. Yeah. So you're not going to look at me and be like, oh, he doesn't know what he's on about. Well, if I don't, then why am I doing live calls for you guys? Yeah. Right. But then, yeah. So I would definitely want to like see something, something I can reference, mm -hmm. something I can look at. Has he done it before? You know, people can lie about they've done it before. Has, is he showing some good tips right now? Can he show some good examples? You know? Yeah. You could tell me right now, I mean, if this was a daytime, you could honestly say to me, can you make a call right now? And I would do it because it's so second nature to me. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm completely comfortable teaching it because I do it on a daily basis. Uh, and so on my, even on my content, um, there are many examples of, I'm like, I will give, like, I will teach something about negotiating that I know people will look at and be like, oh, that is unique. Okay. I don't think you would think of that straight away, basically. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's about, I guess you're trying to say it's about being authentic because if you're looking at someone, as you mentioned, they've got a Lambo and they're not doing anything else. Yeah, like, cool. Okay, you've got a Lambo, right? You're standing in front yeah. of a Lambo. But then uh, let's say you're teaching uh, social media marketing, yeah. right? Okay, great. Uh, why don't you uh, show us a call and how you got a client in social media marketing? Yeah. If you can't even do that, then I wouldn't really be interested in your course. Yeah. But, you know, if you can be like, no, no, look, this is how I got a client and this is how I do my marketing. Uh, you know, and it doesn't have to be everything because then what's the point of the course, right? But 
just a tip where you can be like, oh no, he does seem like he knows what he's on about. Okay, okay, yeah. So you think it's about being more smart with the way that you portray yourself. For example, if someone's selling a course, um, let's say I was selling a course, is how I portray myself, like give out free content. And yeah, that, for sure. That will... Yeah. It's, but it's more free content, right? But also like something which is actually beneficial to the people where they're like, oh, this really helped. Like I might give, uh, like for example, I've done a couple of videos like, oh, how to get an email of a client when they don't give you their email yeah. or how to negotiate with a client or how to close a client. These are yeah. free videos that I've done, right? But watching those videos, I'm sure you can ha- get an idea and be like, oh no, clearly it does seem like he knows what he's on about because why, like what he's saying makes sense. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, I tell people uh, when they're negotiating, it's not important necessarily to only negotiate on money, right? Let's say someone wants something for a thousand pounds. It's not important for you to just get it for 900 pounds. Maybe you negotiate how quickly you can get the money. Maybe you negotiate, okay, I'll do it for 900 pounds. But next time I want exclusive business for a month, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, next time, you know, you don't work with anyone, you know, you don't work with anyone else. You give it a quicker, you give the money quicker. There's other things you can negotiate with, right? Rather than just the money. Now, I know. Most people don't know that stuff, right? So by me saying this, I'm sure it'll like a light bulb. Okay, clearly, like he's actually given a good tip. Evidently, he knows something, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's like then you can, I would say, reference reference content, reference people. If it's just Lambos and Ferraris and stuff, yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I wouldn't go there. But if they're giving good content, good free advice, good, and you're like, no, he clearly knows what he's on about, then yeah, I would. So I guess it's the, it's the idea of like reinforcing for someone watching you. It's like they've come on your page and they've seen like, you know, you're talking about recruitment or you're talking like an example of whatever you're doing. And then they've seen that you're selling a course and then you've seen on your story, you're posting like different stories about it. And it's like reinforcing it and it's more likely for them to buy your course. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, though, look, if it was just about people buying the course, yeah. then yeah, definitely. I'd be taking pictures with Lambos and Ferraris because clearly people like that. Yeah. Right. Evidently, I don't I mean, I don't know why it's silly. Right. I will I will never feel like I need to show people how much money I have. Yeah. Honestly, I think that's ridiculous because I don't I generally don't believe people who have an element of money need to show it. Yeah. They just don't. Uh, the only reason you need to show your money off is because you feel like you need an element of, you know, people to be happy with you and and, mm-hmm. and oh, accepting of you and oh wow, he's got money. I don't care. Like, honestly, it doesn't matter. Like, I'd rather put 10 grand into a business and make something of it than spend 10 grand trying to impress people. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not just about, what I'm saying is it's not just about like selling courses. It's just, it's more the fact that um, if I'm giving free beneficial advice, because when you come on my stuff, you will see some videos which make you think, you will see some videos which will teach you something and others might just be whatever sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But there are videos that will teach you something as well. And so that's what I would say. I think it's important to be able to um, teach for free as well. Yeah, obviously I was focusing more on the selling courses Yeah, just for anyone that's you know in a successful business and they're thinking of selling courses, like what kind of advice. But I guess it's right for them not to get carried away with that and think about, you know, I have to sell the course. Yeah. At the end of the day, like it benefits both people, like the person gaining, as long as it's like, beneficial for the person yeah because look but, people see me and they're like oh look he's rec- yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about something right but they're like oh how is he just making videos oh yeah because he runs his, his own recruitment company or yeah. oh yeah we know that oh he's in his office he's re- doing his work and he's made a video you know yeah. it's very I'm very open and clear about my office space and I'm sitting there in front of my desktop and you know what I mean like if I'm like oh I make X amount of money and I'm just like driving around sort of thing when do you work then like when, when are you ever yeah. doing anything but I'm actually there in the office doing my recruitment work and then I'll make a video. So that's why no, no one ever says to me like, do you actually do this? Because obviously I do it. You, you, yeah, if you go through my it. content, it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. So it's just like you're documenting everything you're doing and yeah, you're of course. Staying, staying authentic. With your social media posts and the content that you create, and obviously this is like, you know, uh, universal kind of thing. Like you have to stay consistent with it. And obviously you post a lot, like all the time on my Instagram, it's just your, your face coming up every two seconds. Every, every every two seconds, just like whatever something you're posting or like a video or a clip, how important is that? And how do you stay on track? You know, it's crazy. I didn't, I t- well, I'll tell you this. Yeah. I think one, social media is very powerful. I think anyone that's not uploading on social media is missing a massive, massive, yeah. uh, like you're missing out basically. Mm. 
Um, so anyone who is trying to run or go in business, I, I definitely am a massive advocate of going on social media and doing things on social media. I mean, I have actually got clients from social media, yeah. recruitment clients, right? Um, I have too many clients where I don't actually try to get more clients now just because I don't have time for them. But social media is m very, very powerful. Consistency is very important as well. I think also, I have to be honest though, I only do like five or 10% of, uh, my content right now is 10% of where I want it to be, maybe less, 5%. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of improvement that I can do with my content, which I will be doing when I go to Dubai. Yeah. Because I'm going to have people around like with editors and people helping me and stuff like that. Um, so my content right now is only 5% to where I want it to be. Though consistency is important, and I'll give you an example. I didn't upload for six days, seven days, and like the reach and everything like that dropped by, uh, well, it dropped by about 200% in six days. Wow. So consistency is very important. Was that on your YouTube channel? That was on my Instagram. On your Instagram, okay. I didn't upload for six days, and uh, um, you know, the reach was, I think it was like, you know, we were doing about like impression in terms of impressions. We were probably doing about, I think it was about 30k, mm -hmm. 30, 35k, and it, it dropped down to uh, I think 10k within six days. Yeah, I guess yeah. when you're on the, when you're constantly posting, people will keep seeing it, and it's like you know, you're there, and you know, if you're not there, then you're not out of sight, and out I of think, mind. <laughs> I think look, as long as you're giving benefit, 100%, there are going to be people that will get annoyed, that will be like, oh man, too much, too much, too much. It's fine. Just get people. The only reason, people, one of the biggest reasons why people don't do well on social media is because they're scared. Yeah. Fear is one of the biggest reasons you don't do well on social media. But as long as you're giving benefit and a good advice and helping and etc. etc. I assure you, man. Even the people that don't like or you know, you come up consistency. For for example, there are many people who actually have disagreed with me in the past and then messaged me and said, "Bro, I need something. What uh, can you? What about this? Or or you know what? You were right. Or, so it's fine. Yeah. You know. So when you. When you're, it's obviously your, your social media following is, it's like, you know, it's very good right now. Um, how did it start? How did you like start it? And like, you know, what was the kind of things? Did you just like throw out content consistently? Or was it so, like more about building a community? Well, I first, I first ever, um, well, if I go back, basically, I, it's probably been about two, two, two years and a bit. Yeah. But that's when I actually started on social media. Um, and it was in COVID. That's why, when I started. Um, and I first ever started on TikTok. Yeah. I started making videos on TikTok. Um, again, same stuff. I wasn't dancing or anything, but um, I started making the same sort of stuff but I was doing on TikTok and I didn't do it on Instagram Reels. Actually, to be fair, that was a mistake. A mistake I learned from now um, that it's very important to, it's just important to upload everywhere, to be honest. Um, there was, so I was uploading on TikTok and I knew it was like a younger generation and I didn't care what I was talking about. I didn't, it, it just didn't bother me as much. But on Instagram, I had like a lot of people that maybe I would think, oh, he's gonna see my content, right? Mm. And so that would definitely affect me. And so I wouldn't upload on, on Instagram as much. In fact, hardly ever. Um, and then I, you know, now I'm definitely way over that. But um, yeah, I think fear is one of the biggest things. So I started uploading like two years ago. I did it on TikTok, did it on YouTube. You know, YouTube, I, you know, carried on basically. And so did I with TikTok. TikTok, I probably stopped though, to be yeah. fair. Slowed down completely. Um, I don't know if I will continue on TikTok Why or not. Why is that? I think TikTok, the app itself, I'm not a massive fan of mm. it. I don't really want to be consuming the content. And I think when you're um, making content on TikTok, you end up consuming it. Yeah, uh, and I think on TikTok itself, if consumed too much, is quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know, I, bro, honestly, I didn't like consume for six days. I remember that, like six days, I like locked off TikTok, and it was like I could think straight again. Weird, super weird. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah I definitely don't want to be consuming, and I feel like when you're creating it, though, maybe when I'm in Dubai, I will um, have people you know, yeah. uploading for me sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I personally think that if you're going down the route for viral content, yes, TikTok is probably the best. Oh, I, I definitely yeah. agree. I definitely agree that, okay, I'll tell you this. Currently, and I'm, I'm, I say, I'm saying this with my like, I'm no for a fact, basically, yeah. come next year, you can re-upload this video, basically, and people will be like, oh, is that Gary Vee? <laughs> but basically, TikTok, um, YouTube Shorts, and also LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn is very powerful as well. Um, 
but it's also about how you use these platforms. LinkedIn's an untouched platform, which is very monetizable, basically. Mm -hmm. People on TikTok, so for example, you can get 10,000 views on TikTok. Yeah. You might get one conversion. Yeah. Whatever that is, by the way. Um, on Instagram, you might get 8,000 views or 10,000 views um, with two conversions. Mm -hmm. The conversions on Instagram is better. If you get 10,000 views on LinkedIn, you're probably looking at like five to seven conversions. Mm -hmm. So the conversion rate, the monetization type, people in people on LinkedIn have money, right? Yeah. They're the working class, they're the middle class. And so LinkedIn is actually very powerful as well. Uh, and I think it is going to be something which is soon come as well, next one, two years. Okay, in terms of like someone that's doing like social media content? In terms stuff. of social media, okay. Um, I think LinkedIn has its place as well. Okay, okay. So you haven't, obviously you haven't seen your LinkedIn, so is it the same kind of stuff you post on there? So or? I've only practically last week started uploading on, t on LinkedIn. Yeah. Just because I think that that is a powerful place to be as yeah, well. Yeah, because right? I've thought about that for the podcast as well. I haven't got around to it, but I thought about it. I was like, who says like you can't post like that kind of thing? Like, you know, because obviously you always see like... I think something, like, something very interesting, actually, one of, a good friend of mine said, told me once, and um, he said that one... I think he said two things to be fair. He said one, one video can change your life. Yeah. One video could change the rest of your life, right? Uh, okay, like for example, I'm sure now if you had Andrew Tate sitting here, change the rest of your life, mm -hmm. for example, right? Yeah. So one video can, if you have one viral video can change your life. And two, sometimes people get uh, into this, oh, I've only had 300 views. I've only had 400 views. Rather how you should see it is 300 people, 300 humans, individuals sitting behind the computer or desktop are watching me. Hmm. 300, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not necessarily about the views, it's about the person. There are 300 people watching you. That's crazy. Because if they were in a hall, you'd be like, wow, 300 people turned up. Yeah. But just because it's on a video, you're like, only 300? It's hmm. how you see it, man. 100% mm -hmm. agree. Yeah, in terms of like what you said, so you're saying like, um, one second. It's funny how you mentioned about the 300 people if it was in a hall rather than uh, behind the screen. So is that is that something that you are like going to do, like public speaking and stuff? Because I've thought about that and, you know, that's one of my weak points. And you said that you're obviously good at speaking and talking to people. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you're going to look for, like look to do in the future or like? Yeah, I think I think I would do it. I don't know if right now I'm like, Oh, I can't wait to do public speaking. Yeah. I think yeah, I would do it, but I think like I, I somewhat do public speaking already to a certain extent anyway. Yeah. Like I might do like an event where I'm like, oh, you know, 30, 40 people could come down or sort of something like that. So I would definitely, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sh shying away from it. I just don't have, you know, the next one, two years for me are somewhat booked out. Um, yeah, understandable. But yeah, I would never say never. Yeah, because I think obviously social media reach is one thing, but sitting in front, like in an auditorium or something, sitting, sitting, hearing someone speak, it's, 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 you know, magnifies a lot more Yes, with people. 100%. Um, but yeah, I think that's the end of the podcast now. I uh, can't think of anything else that we have to talk no, about. No, that's fine. But, you know, I could, go, I could go on for a long time, but it's getting late as well. And, you know, I <laughs> to think it's half nine. Been here for about two hours. I think this is the longest podcast so far. <laughs> nice one. Yeah, it's been great. It's been I appreciate a great it. pleasure having you on. No, no, a lot no, of good content to come from this. I appreciate Hopefully you having for me both on. of us. <laughs> appreciate you having me on. No worries. And uh, I know we were meant to do this uh, sooner, and I didn't get around <laughs> to it. So, like, it's forgive fine. me for that. But shall I? So it's it's of benefit to the people, and I hope both people Inshallah. benefit. No worries, bro. Thank you. All right, Thank you guys for watching this episode today. Make sure you guys stream on spotify and like comment and subscribe on youtube you can find us on instagram visionation underscore so thank you guys for tuning in whether you're listening to this on spotify or watching on youtube